the pictures that that Tony takes of Margaret, as I say, are unlike anything that's ever been seen. And when they end up on the front page of the paper, well, it's almost enough to make the Queen choke on her cornflakes. My name is Katie Nicholl, Vanity Fair's Royal Correspondent, and today I'll be reviewing clips from the television show, The Crown. I'm here in London in isolation, like many of you, housebound, so what better opportunity than now to dip into the three brilliant series of The Crown to really depict what is fact and what is fiction. Please excuse any technical difficulties because we are recording on Skype. It's the best way that we can bring our VF reviews to you at home. Sit back and enjoy. Ma'am, the word has reached me that it is your desire that you and your children keep your husband's name Mount Mountbatten. It is. Ma'am, you must not. It would be a grave mistake. This is from actually my favourite series of, of The Crown, the first series, partly because I just think Claire Foy was absolutely outstanding playing Princess Elizabeth and, and then the Queen. This scene is a really powerful scene because as Elizabeth comes to terms with being Queen, she became Queen when she was just a young girl. Her father, George VI, had died. There was so much change for her after that. And one of the major changes was was Philip and what his position in the household was going to be. In this scene, you see Churchill making it very clear what Philip's title has to be. His real name, you'll not need reminding, was Schleswig Holstein Sonderberg Glucksberg of the royal houses of Denmark and Norway and latterly of Greece. It is absolutely the case that the Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, had concerns about Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, what his title, what his name should be. And you should be no exception. Yes, I am Queen, but I am also a woman. You see the Queen explaining that she isn't just a Queen, she is a wife as well. And she knows that, you know, Philip is a strong man, he could be quite opinionated, and he had already felt very much relegated to second place, that he was always going to play second fiddle to his wife. So she knew that giving him a title, a name in his own right, um, so that he had a place and a prominence in the family was really important. You know, when the Queen did put her foot down, she made it clear that he had an important role within the royal family and his past and his history and his heritage couldn't simply be erased because it was more convenient for the British government. Well, I was lucky enough to visit the set of The Crown for the first series, and I was absolutely blown away by how beautifully produced this series was. The attention to detail, the recreation of Buckingham Palace. You know, I have to say, they, they did do a brilliant job. Trade unionists and businessmen in the Abbey. If you want to stay on the throne, yes. In a trimmed down, televised coronation. If you want to avoid a revolution, yes, you forget. I have seen firsthand what it is like for a royal family to be overthrown because they're out of step with the people. And not a lot of people realize that, that Philip has been a huge moderniser for the royal family. You know, this is about her coronation, whether or not it's going to be televised. Elizabeth feels that it cheapens everything by having it in people's living rooms. She feels that, you know, she has been taught by her father that the magic of monarchy is its mystique. I left Greece in an orange crate. My father would have been killed. My grandfather was. I'm just trying to protect you. From whom? The British people? You have no idea who they are or what they want. Oh, oh, I'm just Johnny Foreigner again, who doesn't understand. Fine, fine. A lot of this background is accurate about Greece, where Philip came from. He's able to bring a, a different perspective to Elizabeth. Philip is astute enough to recognise that the people need to get behind her as queen. They want to feel a part of this. You want a big overblown ceremony costing a fortune while the rest of the country is on rations? Have it, but don't come bleating to me when your head and the heads of our children are on spike. I think it's true to say that the depiction of Philip is a, is a little bit of a stereotype, you know, that he's very brusque and abrupt. Without a doubt, he's a strong character. I think probably the producers on the show have, have capitalised on that. Well, if you put it in their homes, I'll have them to watch it with their dinner on their laps. Democratise it, make them feel that they share in it, understand it. All right. 
night. Well, you see the Queen in this scene giving in to her husband. It was the first coronation to be televised and it was a great success. So ultimately, I think on many key occasions, the Queen does listen to her husband when actually it goes against her natural instinct. And I don't think people give Philip enough credit for being the modernizer in the royal family that it, that he has been on, on so many things from you know driving an electric car to saying to his wife you want the people to be behind you let them into your living room Bermuda, Jamaica, Australia, Ceylon, Uganda is going to be hot your majesty to that end, we've been working a great deal with Organza, Crepe de Chine, and Shantung Silk. This would have absolutely happened. The Queen would have been presented with a lookbook, with textures, with fabrics, with gowns, with ideas. Nothing is by chance when it comes to the royal wardrobe. Everything has been carefully coordinated, carefully picked. We also wanted to feature something particular to each location. So we thought sprigs of native wild flowers indigenous to each country that you'll visit. She will colour coordinate, or her aides will colour coordinate um, her outfit so that she uses the colours to pay tribute to the host nation. On Her Majesty's arrival in Sydney, we propose a white organza dress scattered with pale yellow wattle blossom. Now, how many dresses are there? 100. 100? And hats? 36. Pairs of shoes? 50. Isn't this all a bit much? Well, it does sound like a lot, doesn't it? That many pairs of shoes. For Queen Elizabeth, who was about to embark on an all-important tour of the Commonwealth, she was away for nearly six months. But when you look at that Commonwealth tour wardrobe, she really wore some spectacular hats. She played with colour. And don't forget that this was a tour designed to grab headlines around the world. It made her visible. She had the world stage as a platform, what she wore was incredibly important. Whether that is her use of block colour, her absolute passion for hats, her penchant for Lawn Air handbags. You know, she has owned these styles, these brands. She has made them her own. Being quite short, you know, she's not much over five foot. A hat and a strong colour is a great way to pop out and be seen in the crowd. We don't know who you are either. The rest of us outside the palace gates. That's because we keep feeding you the fairy tale. So in this clip, we're seeing Tony Armstrong Jones, who Margaret went on to marry, photographing her in his studio. Like this. Oh. Jesus. I'm sorry, but uh, Cecil is a disgrace. When they refer to Cecil, they're talking about Cecil Beaton, who for many years was the photographer that the royal family would go to for official portraits and pictures. But the pictures that Tony took of Margaret were completely different. But their business with Peter Townsend. One of the things I love about Margaret is the love affairs that she has that are so well captured in the crown. There is a real a sexual tension between them that I think is really well captured. pictures that, that Tony takes of Margaret, as I say, are unlike anything that's ever been seen. And when they end up on the front page of the paper, well, it's almost enough to make the Queen choke on her cornflakes, as you see later on in this series. <laughs> Vanessa Kirby plays Margaret beautifully. There is an amazing, not just physical resemblance, but the way that she has Margaret's isms, from the way that she lights her cigarettes, to the way that she dances, the way that she moves, she really does have Margaret down to the teeth. So she's everything that the Queen can't be. She's the younger sister who can be the Queen of Mustique, the royal rebel, flamboyant when it comes to partying and entertaining, and, you know, an absolute lover of all things sartorial. And the royal wardrobe for Margaret is absolutely fantastic in this series of The Crown. So what are you going to do? 
Princess Anne has a reputation for being probably the most down-to-earth royal, and there is a brilliant scene in that episode where Prince Philip, her father, is sat down and said, we need you to sit down with the journalist. Actually, I was hoping we might talk about what you're going to do. I would like to offer you to the Manchester Guardian. Prince Philip, as we said earlier, was um, in charge of the royal family and its image. So he sends Anne to be interviewed by the Guardian, not a paper that was going to be sympathetic to the royal family. On this particular moment, the Duke of Edinburgh suggests going for a, a, a left-wing paper. Why them? Why not the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail or someone we could expect to be a little bit friendly? Not only is the likeness so uncanny, she has all of Princess Anne's feistiness. She has Anne's one-liners down to a T. Because in the light of all this criticism, uh, you know, an endorsement from our most vocal critics would represent more of a turnaround. If we can get an endorsement. You're the most thrifty, feet on the ground, low profile, unpretentious royal we've got. If anyone can salvage this, you can. And the interview is a great success because it really scratches beneath the surface. So this idea that Princess Anne was really pushed out um, to promote a different image of the royal family, it, it did happen. So this idea of the royals using the press um, is something that, that continues today. Happened then, still happens now. What the Crown has successfully done is boosted an interest in the British royal family. You know, you hear people talking about it now in a way that they didn't before. So, you know, Peter Morgan, the creators of The Crown, have really tapped into something that fascinates us, prompts a national conversation, and I think probably has, has triggered a huge interest in the British royal family. People who perhaps might not have been so interested in the Queen and what the royal family does are now taking much more of an interest, and that's largely down to the popularity, I think, of The Crown.